things that Brother Rhodes, when he started this church and, and over the years, um, he was a man that taught us the importance of victory in our everyday lives. Um, until Brother Rhodes came into my life, I, I listened to numerous uh, men of God, and everyone kind of has, every minister of God has a gifting in different areas. And so a lot of people get those giftings confused, and so they, they, they you know, say, you know, this man's right, that man's wrong, and they put uh, preachers up against each other and all that stuff, and it's pretty carnal for the most part. But uh, one of the things that he really focused on was the importance of walking in victory in our everyday life. And uh, this is the most important thing that can happen to us as believers. If we can get Christians that are in our churches week in and week out, if we can get them away from just walking happy and free for one day a week and get them into a seven day, every week, every month, the whole year long victorious cycle. Do you realize what we could do as a church? Do you realize the impact we could have on people's lives around us? Do you think that uh, we may not be accused of being hypocrites quite as much anymore if we would be victorious in everyday life? So, um, I believe many believers go through the Christian life living from one spiritual experience to another. While these moments of freedom and touches from heaven are awesome and valuable, I believe we are settling for less than what God has called us to walk in. And with that in mind, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you this morning for your grace. I thank you this morning for your understanding. I thank you for wisdom, God. Lord, let the river of God flow in this place. Lord, let the, the anointing of God that destroys yokes in people's lives, let them be loosed, let them be broken off. And Heavenly Father, may there be a shout of victory, a shout of triumph come forth out of this place. In Jesus' name, amen. So, Brother Rhodes was a man that taught us the importance of victory in our everyday lives. Many of us here experience the freedom that those teachings brought us in, our, in each one of our lives. Uh, those teachings changed the process of our thinking, changed the way we do things in our everyday life, and they've all been changed for the better of it. In Philippians 4, verse 7 7, 8, 9, it says, And the peace of God, which passeth all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. I don't know about you, but I want that. All right, I need this. It's easy to wake up happy on Sabbath morning, the day we're going to go to church and we're going to spend time together with like-minded believers and be in fellowship. But the other six days of the week, they may be a little different because life may stare us right in the face and right in the eyes and present us some challenges that we're going to need God's help to overcome. And so it's important that God deals with our spirits first, but with the soulish part of who we are, the way we think, the way we process life. See, every day we're faced with a current of negativity around us. That's, the, that's, where, that's where the world's going. It's, it's negative. It's hell-bent on negativity. And so um, it takes somebody with, with, with the Word of God instilled inside of them to be able to row the boat the other direction. And if you and I choose to do something different and go the other way, we immediately put ourselves in positions of being able to help and problem-solve people's lives. Because negativity leads us into problems, doesn't it? It leads us into pits. It leads us into snares. It leads us into bondage. It leads us into slavery. And so that's where the world's at. But they're looking for hope. The world's looking for hope. And the world's looking for people like you and I to make a difference. 
And so as a pastor, as a child of the living God, it's, we have the opportunity to wake up in the morning with the peace of God enveloping us each and every day that we live. That's for you. That's for me. I know Brother Rhodes many times he would say, I've done away with bad days. We don't do bad days anymore. It's not to say that there won't ever be any challenges, but listen, folks, having the difference between many of us having a bad day and a good day is a decision that we make in our hearts. And how much we allow ourselves to be swayed by the negativity and the, and the, and the current of negative that's around us. How much we allow ourselves to be moved in that current. Did you know the man and the woman that's going to walk in victory is going to be a person that's going to have to make some uh, pretty serious declarations and some pretty serious decisions to do something different. So, the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, check, check, check. Whatsoever things are pure, check. Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. That takes work. That takes discipline. That takes the Holy Ghost. It takes the anointing of God in our life. That's why... There's a lot of talk in this day and generation about the, the values of positive thinking and, uh, and, and valuing yourself in a proper manner. And uh, many of it, a lot of it helps a lot of people out, and I don't want to downplay it. But on the other hand, we need more. We need something called the anointing. Because the anointing is not only going to destroy the yokes of slavery and bondage in our life, but it's going to have an effect on people around us. It's going to cause people, men and women, that come into our lives, into our everyday lives, when they get around you and I, they have all of a sudden the, uh, there's certain standards that come up in their life. There's certain, uh, I don't know really how to put it into words, but there's something about, when you get in the presence of a person that's serving God, that it makes you more conscious of serving God. It makes you more conscious, conscious of doing right and wrong. Is that not true? Have you ever been around certain people and all of a sudden you're like, well, you know, hmm, I better watch my language. I better watch what I say. I better watch the things that I do because... Uh, uh, there's something about that person, I just feel like I shouldn't be doing it around them. That's why you get around uh, the presence of, of some of these, you know, uh, hillbilly, redneck, uh, street people, whoever it is. And you don't have to say a thing to them about being a Christian, but they start apologizing for the foul language that comes out of their mouth. Right? That's the influence that we need. You don't have to apologize for being a Christian to those kind of people. I think too often we apologize for that. And it's okay to raise the standard in our generation. Someone's got to do it. Amen? Okay. So, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. And then Paul has the audacity to say this. This is a bold statement, y'all. Could I say this? That's a good question. Could you say this? That's a good question. Those things which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in Jesus Christ do, and the God of peace shall be with you. That's not what it says? Oh, someone's awake. My wife's awake. What does it say? Oh, yeah. 
How many of you are willing to walk a Christian life to that kind of a standard? How many of you are so confident in what you're doing for God and in God that you can look at someone and say, if you do what I do, you're going to make it to heaven. If you do the things that I'm doing, you're going to be safe. Because I'm going to make sure the stumbling blocks are out of the way. I got to make sure that when you come into my life, you don't open up doors and go, whoa! You ever thought you liked a person or admired certain people, and then the closer you got to them, you open up doors and you said, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. We've got to be men and women that are dependable. Can we be real with the world? You know, there's this, I didn't, I didn't tell Manny about this, but uh, a gentleman the other day, he's a contractor, he's, he's been in and out of jail, and he's, he's a young guy, and, and he's, he's just, he just talks. Anyway, he's like, he's like uh, you know, he said, your company, he said, you guys are the real deal. He said, uh, we do, we do some work for some of these other companies, say they're Christians and stuff, but he said, man, he said, I don't know about some of these people. He said, they just don't live it. He said, but when I get around your company, he said, you guys are the real deal. What, I don't even think I ever really witnessed to him about the Lord Jesus. I mean, we had some, we've had some intimate talks here and there about some things, and, and I've gotten on his case about stuff. But can we be those kind of people? Can, can I invite you into my house and know that everything's going to be safe? That I ain't got, you know, my, uh, you know, certain stuff stashed away in closets and, and all this other stuff that uh, I don't want no one to find out because I'm a Christian. And I don't, you know, I don't want them to know that, that I'm doing this kind of stuff. We need to be real people. There was something about the legacy of Brother Rhodes when I when I met him, that was different. I, I can honestly say he was one of the greatest people that I've ever spent time with. And that's coming from a, a person that's probably spent more time with him than many people, anyway, for the last 10, 12 years. And some of you have gotten to spend time with him. But just to be able to hop in a vehicle and drive across the country or drive down the road, and he just tell me about his life. Just talk about this, talk about that. And I found out through the course of time that he's actually a normal human being. <laughs> and that he deals with emotions like you and I. And you know what that did to me? It kind of made me feel like, oh, okay, so I don't have to be like this, you know, this super uh, spiritual human being that floats and lives in the clouds all day every day to be able to live for God. I found out he's a man with like passions, just like you and I are. But on the other hand, there was always a moving in a certain direction. He was, he was diligent about the God that he served. I would testify to you, and I know from the years that I spent with him, that when he talked about waking up at 2, 3, 4 o'clock in the morning to pray and seek God, that he wasn't joking. If you spent any time with him, you would find out if you woke up around 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, there was a light on in his bedroom. And he was praying and seeking God. Now there's a lot of people have had a lot of opinions about Brother Rhodes over the years. But I don't know any of them that got up at 2 and 3 o'clock every morning and prayed and sought the face of God. May I preach for a few minutes? The people that want to knock down Billy Graham and all these men of God that have done these, none of them have saved as many souls. None of them have sought God. None of them have influenced as many people as they have. If you're going to walk with God, you're going to do anything for God, you're going to have to get above the critics because someone's going to want to try to pull you down to their world. And men and women that live in victory, we don't go there. We are seated in heavenly places 
in Christ Jesus. And that's where we stay. That's where we live. That's where we walk. That's, that's what we do. So you may have challenges in everyday life. And those challenges may cause you to uh, snap. They may cause you to make decisions that you don't want to do. Uh, they may cause you to do things that ain't Christian from time to time, but we've got, we've got to rise above that. We've got to do better. We can't always be, every time we get into a rut, default back to the old man. No! There's a place that God wants to help us. Freedom is walking in God's plan and purpose for our life. It's where God wants us. He wants us in the river. He wants us seeking His face. He wants us delighting to do His will. There's hope, folks. There's hope for you no matter where you're at. No matter where your marriage is at, where your children are at, where your grandchildren, there's hope for your life. Because Jesus is king. And the river of God is free for anyone who wants it. So, there's a vein of freedom from sin and a personal anointing. There's an anointing that God has for you in your life that, he's calls, that He calls you to, and He's calling you to rise up and grab it. That anointing is going to be a little different for each person. It's going to look a little different, but it's going to have the same effect on the world around us. It's going to set people free. It's going to cause men and women around you to want to serve God. It's going to cause men and women around you to rise up to levels that they normally wouldn't rise up to if you, wasn't, if you weren't on the scene. That's why it's so important that we as mothers and, and, and fathers that we, that we set the standard of excellence in our lives. That we choose God every day. That we choose life. That we and our seed may live. It's important. Let's go to Psalm verse four, chapter 40, rather. Okay, so we're talking about victorious believers. I want to be victorious. I want to be that man. You need to be that woman that is no longer controlled and steered by the lusts inside of you, that are warring against the Spirit, okay? If you choose to serve God, you choose to live for God, you know what that war is all about. But there's a place that we get to where the battle doesn't stop. The battle just enters a new arena. And, we're, and it's where you and I go, go, to, go from walking in victory in our everyday lives to helping other people attain that same thing that God has called you to walk in. So the battle changes, but the battle doesn't get any less. So as believers, we need to make sure that you and I are walking in that everyday victorious life. We're solid. We're established. We're firm. We know the God we serve. We know the life we live. And listen, folks, it does make a difference. Okay. Here's the psalmist. I waited patiently for the Lord, and He inclined unto me, and He heard my cry. How many of y'all want God to hear your cry? I do. We need God in our life. We need Him to hear our cry. But here's a voice of victory rising up. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. Now, what's that horrible pit that you may be trying to climb up out of right now? What is it? Is it maybe lust? Maybe it's pornography? Maybe it's unforgiveness? Maybe there's someone in this house that you don't like. 
Maybe it's envy. Maybe jealousy. Maybe you just don't really want to serve God. This God thing has gotten boring. I've done it for years now, and I tell you what, just the same old, same old, and I ain't getting to see none of the fruit of it. Well, let me give you some news. It's the end of July, and the summer heat's turned on. Just wait a little longer, and it's going to be over, and you're going to harvest, but you need to hang in there. How many, how many of us drop the harvest, right? In, it's, it's coming, and we turn. And we want to do things a little different. And we want to change. And so we walk away from the fields we've been planting all these years. We walk away from it. Because I'll tell you what, it hasn't been working. There's been farmers like that. Declare bankruptcy in the middle of July. And all them crops are out in the field. Come on. <clears throat> So what's your horrible pit? He brought me up also out of a horrible pit. And out of the miry clay. It's nasty stuff. Set my feet upon a rock and establish my goings. And the Amplified, it says this. He drew me out of a horrible pit. A pit of tumult and of destruction. Out of the miry clay. And in parentheses it says, the froth and the slime. You ever been messing around on that stuff? Oh yeah. That's what unforgiveness is like. You don't need to live your life. It's not worth it. Let it go. Let it go. It's not worth it. Those old feelings of envy, let it go. Don't waste your life in that world of true, just... Every day, it's, you, you're, being, you're being delivered to, the, to a tormenting spirit, the Bible says. It's not worth it. Let it down. Let it go. Freedom is yours. Freedom is yours. Wouldn't you just like, like to have a heart that loves no matter what? I would. A heart that has joy even in spite of the adverse circumstances? I would like that. Wouldn't you like peace around you as a fortified city? Wouldn't you love to have faith that can just hang in there and remain stable and be a step? Wouldn't you like to have some long suffering even though you've been suffering for a long time? That God just blesses you with long suffering in the middle of the battle. Wouldn't you like to have some temperance? Finally, you got some self-control in your life. Those old lusts ain't controlling you. And, and you know, every Sunday the football game turns on, you ain't controlled by whether your Monday morning isn't controlled by whether or not the Redskins or the Cowboys win the game. I remember being controlled by that stuff. My Monday morning was happy depending on whether the Steelers won the game. If my team won, I was, Monday was great. If my team lost, uh, then I had to deal with those crazy Eagles fans that God placed me into. All my life, I was surrounded by Eagles and I had to stand up against them and tell them time and time again that we won so many more Super Bowls than you have. But anyway, that's, those are arguments from long ago. I've let that go. Every now and then I bring it up on purpose. And he's put a new song in my mouth. I want a new song. We sang about times of refreshing. God wants to give us times of refreshing. Those seasons of life where God touches us. And there's no explanation for it other than the anointing of God. I'm here to tell you there's victory in this room this morning for some of you who want it. There's victory. 
God's in the process of liberating his people. God's in the process of delivering fruit to this house. I want it. Because I need more love for tomorrow. I've got to have more joy in my heart. I've got to have more peace in my marriage and in my home. God, my work is just feels like a 10-ton card I'm trying to pull when I can't never get ahead. God, help me. He wants to deliver resources to you. I don't know what that's going to look like, but God's the answer for everything. Not, not some kind of self-help, self-motivating book. It may do you good, but ultimately God's going to be your source of inspiration and hope. He is a sustaining force in our spirits and in our lives and our hearts. He wants to help you. And he's put a new song in my mouth. He even prays unto our God. And many shall see it in fear. Victory. Men and women composed. Men and women with, 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 with a, a different look on life. I need it as a pastor. Because i got to deal with the same kind of ruts that you, everyone else gets into from time to time. <coughs> and we all know the rut we're talking about. We default. When the going gets tough, we default to that old way of doing things. And we ain't in it very long we start feeling condemned. We start feeling depressed. It takes energy to stay out of the rut. It takes passion to stay out of the rut. It takes you and I doing something to stay out of the rut. Because the negativity of the world is going to steer you back into that rut. Even praise to our God, many shall see it in fear and shall trust in the Lord. And later on the same chapter, now listen to this. This is the cry of a victorious believer. How many of you want this from the depths of your heart? I do. I delight to do thy will, O oh my God. Now, the will of God for your life doesn't need to be drudgery. Let me, let, me, let me make an even bolder state, statement. It shouldn't be drudgery to you. The psalmist said, now this is a man walking in freedom. I delight. God, this is where you have me right now, and I'm going to delight in you because you've given me something to sing for. You put a new song in my heart and in my mouth. And this time of refreshing that I need God, I'm going to have it. This is what I'm going to have. I'm going to be a man, that woman of faith, that is not going to let go of God until the rain comes. The rain's coming. The fruit is coming. It's going to be delivered to those who are simple and innocent. The simple and the innocent amongst us are the people that God's going to bless. Now, in this world, you got to be really smart because it's complicated. The world has a way of complicating things. And only certain smart people really rise above all the complicated. And so if you don't have, you know, you don't have the thinking capacity, you don't have the money, you don't have the genetics and all this stuff... You're probably just going to be a nobody all your life and barely get ahead. But those very people that the world is going to look down on are the same people that God wants to light up. Because He will never light up a person who bows down to the altar of reason every day of their life. Ain't going to happen. 
I won't go there. I delight to do thy will, O my God, yea, thy law is within my heart. There's a reason he was delighting to do the will of God. The word of God had found a resting place. We need to hunger for God's word. God, give me a hunger for your word so I can delight to do your will. God, help us. Help us, God. It's where we need to go. Living in the will of God is where the freedom lies. Freedom from the weight of sin is a burden that we need to lay at the foot of the cross. God, I give this, I can't handle it. Lord, there's people that have wronged me in the past and, and I would just want to grab them and shake them and I, every day I'm tormented with what they did. Let it go. Let it go. It's not worth our lives. It's not worth the deterioration of our brain cells. Trying to figure out how we're going to get even. Trying to figure out how this is all going to play out. It's not worth it. Lust, unforgiveness, gossip, envy, worldliness, fornication. The works of the flesh are weights that cause, us, cause our sight and the light within us to be darkened. Isaiah 59 verse 10 says, We grope for the wall like the blind. And we grope as if we had no eyes. I don't want to be this person. It's not the will of God for you to be this person. This does not need to be you. A rat in a wheel is not what God created to be for His people. If my wheels are turning, they're going somewhere. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. That's the weight. That's a picture of sin crushing the human spirit. All these acts and lusts of the flesh, crushing our, darkening our vision, crushing our strength, pulling us down and, and kicking us and stomping on us. That's the will of Satan for your life and it will not be so. Not to anyone in here. No! I'm not going to be that person. I'm going to do it God's way. And Lord, I don't know how we're going to get from this spot to God's way. But Lord, you're going to help me. You're going to put energy in my soul. You're going to give me passion. You're going to give me a new refreshing. To stir the very crutches, my innermost depths. They be stirred up to hunger after you once again, God. Lord, rekindle the old flame. Rekindle it, God. There's freedom from these Adamic lusts of the flesh in our lives. It takes repentance. The process of sanctification. God continually molding us and shaping us. It's going to continue till we see Jesus face to face. The process of sanctification is something you and I got to live with. It's God for the rest of our life continuing to purge us, continuing to clean us up and, and, and cause us to walk in greater strength, cause us to walk in greater righteousness, cause us to walk in, in, in the holiness that He's called us to. It's a lifetime. It's a lifetime of God working on us. I'm not talking about justification. You were justified when you, when you uh, said yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. You repented of your sins and you recognized His forgiveness through the, through the mercy of the cross. But that sanctification process, 
That's, that can be a little taxing. Because God, God actually had the audacity to say that I will send my fire. And he's going to purge out his threshing floor. He's going to burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. He's going to lay the axe to the root of all those things that are trying to deny you from God. Trying to get in between you and God. Trying to get us to make decisions that ain't of God. Hebrews 10, 17 says, And their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. That's freedom, folks. That's the will of God for your life. Those old sins, those old ways of doing things, clean slate. You're living a different life now. You have, for the first time in your life, the power is within you to live a different life. It's what we need. A little later on in the chapter, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new... How many of y'all want new? Everyone likes new. It's one of the words you put to any kind of advertisement. New. This is new. By a new and a living way. God. Show me what that new and living way is that you want me to walk in. Newness of life. And it doesn't just happen one time in our life. This is a constant refreshing, renewing, and God leading us higher and higher and causing us to walk further and further. And God leading us from one spot to the next spot. And whatever that looks like in your everyday life, that you would be refreshed continually along the way. Because your heart's honest and upright before God, and because repentance is a part of your life and who you are. Help us, God. Help us. By a new living way which He has consecrated for us through the veil that is to say His flesh. Freedom in our generation says you're free to look like the world, act like the world. Do the things that the world around us does. And then grace covers it. That's the gospel Jesus never endorsed. We know that. We've heard that behind this pulpit. And many condone it by saying that we're saved by the blood of Jesus and works will never save you. That's a lie wrapped in truth. Oh, it looks good. Smells good. Let me taste it. So we put some in our mouth. Oh, it tastes really good. Looks good. Smells good. Tastes good. Check, check, check. It passed my five senses. So it should be good to go. And it actually invigorates us momentarily. Ah, this is something new. I've been too tough on myself. I just need a little bit of, God, this thing, I don't want to... <sighs> My, it seems like I can never, you know, get above, you know, it's like you're always dealing with me. Hello? Are you like Jesus yet? No. But he wants us to become like him, doesn't he? So you think he's going to like deal with us the rest of our life? Are you okay with that? Well, no, the blood of Jesus and all this stuff. And I, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. But the process of sanctification is the blood of Jesus working at you every single day of your life causing you and I to become more like God and changing us and guiding us and leading us. So I don't want to read, I don't want to eat lies that are wrapped in truth. I've eaten too many of them in my lifetime. 
And I've always faced the bitter consequences. See, the Bible says, the Bible has the audacity to say this. By their fruits you shall know them. Uh, does it say by their books that they've written? Does it say by their good speeches and fair words? Their good preaching? Is that what the Bible says or the way we're supposed to know them? Or maybe we should allow people to influence that we know more about their everyday lives than that person way out there who's got a good sermon they can talk about good things and actually help us out a lot. Probably help us out to a certain measure. But we bypass the people that are closest to us in our life to get what we want. That, my friends, is sin. That's sin. We need to be accountable. We need to be men and women that are real. And so what attracted me to Brother Rhodes, uh, even as a young person, was he was real. He'd just flat out tell you sometimes what was wrong. But he never hold it against me. So all my life growing up, when, when, when I was rebuked, it always seemed like there was some kind of crutch against me because someone corrected me or something like that. But with this man, it was different. That's what attracted me to it. And that's the same gospel that we've got to take into this next generation. We've got to be real people. Those people out in the streets, they know real. Because they got to sniff out cons every day of their life. Yeah. And so when they see a real person, they know them. So we got to be that. We got to be that to people in our lives. So, let's talk about these blessings of Abraham that we've been praying about here in church on Wednesday night. First one's the heir of salvation. You are an heir of the salvation of your great God. His righteousness, His anointing, His holiness, His word, everything about who got His creative power. You are an heir of that life. You are called to walk in more than you're walking in right now. There is something greater for you that you haven't attained to. And God's calling us. Son, my son, my daughter, I want you here. I want to help you. I want to bring you up to a new level, to a new place, new walk with you. Ephesians 1 verse 11 says, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, we, through him, have, have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him, who works all things after the counsel of his own will. In Romans 8, 15, read down through 18, it says, For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Abba, Father. God, I need you. Lord, I need you. I can't get through this marriage difficulty without you. I can't get through this difficulty I have at my workplace or maybe it's a child. Maybe it's a teenager that you just don't want to do the things that me as a parent wants them to do. The Spirit itself also bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs. Heirs of God and join heirs with Christ. If so be that we reign with Him. That we may be also glorified together. If so be that we suffer with Him. Ah, so there's a cost. 
there's always a cost. Nothing's free. Nothing's free. I know all the religious cliches that 10,000 Christians will throw at me. But you ask Jesus if his cross wasn't a cost. Come on. The initial gift of salvation is free. And his mercy and his grace is free for everyday life. But I tell you what, when you say yes to God, he puts you on a trail. He puts you on a pathway. And you're called to walk that pathway. And you are not your own anymore, according to the Bible. You are bought with a price. So my will, my plan, my agenda is gone. It's not valid. It's God's agenda now. Lord, have your way. I delight to do thy will, oh, oh my God. All right, redemption from the curse is the next one. Galatians 3.13. God has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on a, on a tree. He has redeemed you and I from slavery. The slavery of sin, unforgiveness, selfishness. He's redeemed you. He's redeemed you and is redeeming you and wants to redeem you from your brain telling you every day that you ain't good enough to serve God. That you can't do this and you can't do that. He's redeemed you from that thought process. Now, now we need to change it. Say, okay, God, I can't have this anymore. There may be some steps I need to take. To get there. Lord, I, I repent. Did you know repenting is the safest thing you can do be, before God? We like to quote our faith scriptures to God. Faith, isn't vo faith is void without repentance. It's void. We've got to have hearts that are soft before God. For this thing to really genuinely work in our lives. Lord, I, it's okay to tell God you're sorry. But then start walking in what you told him you're going to do. God, help me. It's okay. Lord, I need your strength. I need your grace. Lord, download your long-suffering into my spirit for this situation I'm going through. Lord, don't let me say things with my tongue that I shouldn't say. Don't let me think thoughts that are going to take me down into this negative pool that the world's trying to drag me into. God, help me. How about favor with God and man? How many of y'all want favor in your everyday lives? Oh, we need a lot of it. We really do. So shalt thou find favor... And good understanding in the sight of God and man. And that's in Proverbs 3, verse 4. We need favor with our fellow believers. We need favor with each other in this house. But there's someone, someone I go to church with that doesn't like me. Well, I think they don't like me. The other day... I caught them staring at me with a disgruntled look on their face. I know they've got something against me. How do you know that? Get behind me, Satan. We are so sensitive. You know the Bible says love hides a multitude of sins. Did you know the Bible also says that he that is of a faithful spirit conceals the matter? But I tell you what, there's something I don't agree with that's going on in our generation. We are a lawyer-driven society. Oh, 
God help us. We've got to open everything up and we've got to talk about every little detail. And we've got to discuss. And we've got to... Ugh. It's come to the place, especially with work, sometimes it's better off just telling a person when you have difficulties. But I'll tell you what, you can't never delete an email, can you? That text message, man, they might take it to their grave with them and hold it against you. There's something about words that kind of, maybe not with everyone, they kind of fade. And so we're a lawyer-driven society. We think like that. We analyze every little thing. We analyze the tone of voice in people. We analyze uh, body... Ge- and all this stuff, I'm not... Neg- there, it's, it's part... We need to be sensitive to it in a certain measure. But there is a place where you become too sensitive and every little thing everyone does, you're looking for something wrong. Someone did this to me. I know. I didn't hear anything, but I know that person's talking about me behind my back. How do you know that? How do you? Come on now. I know she said this and she's saying that, and I just know that's what she's doing. No, you listening to a lying spirit. Stop it. I would rather, you know where freedom is? Freedom is assuming that person's innocent even when they're not. That's safe. So you think someone's talking about you. Uh, How do you know that? Well, I haven't heard nothing, but I just know. Oh, ho, 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 ho. Hey, hey, ding, ding, ding. You crossed the boundaries. You crossed the bound, and even if they did, you're a Christian, you still cross the boundaries because now you want to get even. Uh, That's where we want to go. This is is a test of our faith, y'all. What is safe? Love is safe. Peace? Bible says... Seek peace and pursue it. Okay, so peace is safe. Blessed are those who get even. The Bible doesn't say that, does it? <laughs> but we want to go there. Well, while I'm holding that person, I, I no. Let it go. You don't let that stuff rot your brain. Let it go. See, then we got to deal with the convicting work of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost says, oh, you shouldn't be thinking that. And then we really start crossing, man. And we start talking to other people about how I know she's talking about me behind my back. Oh, Lord God in heaven. Maybe I'm the only person that has ever dealt with this kind of stuff. Or maybe this is maybe the nature of the carnal mind. Evil surmisings and assumptions. They're out of bounds for victorious believers. Even if they're happening, I can't go there. Lord, I know they're talking. What are you going to do about it? Blow up. You're going to go grab them. And, I mean, I understand there's a, there's a place in time where you need to maybe work things out. But you better go withdraw yourself for about three days and do some praying about it before you decide on the spur of the moment. And you make a knee-jerk reaction and you blow up. I don't need that. We need favor with our fellow believers. We need favor with our neighbors. We need favor with our employers, with sinners. We need a lot of favor with them. Financial prosperity. 
Faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that makes haste to be rich shall not be innocent. Lord, I need your blessing on my life. I will choose to be a steward in the little things that you have called me to. God, right now, I'm only making enough of money to pay my bills. You know what God would say to you? Be faithful in that. Thank God that you're making enough of money to pay your bills. Be a steward of that money. Listen, folks. Walking away from, from, from debt and, and, and throwing our hands up, it's not the answer. We need, we need the blessing of God on our life. Being responsible is the answer. It's where we got to go. The blessing of the Lord, it makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it, Proverbs 10, 22. 1 Timothy 6, 10, 11 says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. But thou, O man of God, flee. I don't want to be pierced with sorrows. Because the decisions I've made to go get rich, to go get money, to go establish my name, to go get wealth and all these things, because God hadn't called me to that road, and neither is He you. He's calling you to walk with Him. The riches will come. The blessings will come as you walk with God. <clears throat> Flee these things, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. The last one is effective ministry. Acts 10.38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Listen, folks, we need to have that. And it goes on to say, who went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed to the devil, for God was with him. Wouldn't you just like God to be with you? Just open up doorways of opportunity and ministry everywhere you go that the life of God is with you and just moving on people's hearts and bringing you into situations where you're like, God, that could have never happened unless you were part of my life. That's who God wants to be to us. He wants to help us. He wants to lead us and guide us. There's a story of Charles Finney, the great revivalist. I believe he lived back in the 1700s, 1800s. And he came from a revival one day. <clears throat> And he wanted to see this machinery that was in this big factory. Apparently he had some connections in the factory, knew the owner. And so he walks in this factory, and uh, there's these two women inside, saw him coming. And the one made a sneering remark to the other, and they started laughing about him. And looked over at him and started laughing. And uh, Charles Finney said, so I just looked at him with compassion. He didn't say a word. And after a while, the lady who made the remark started crying. Conviction. Conviction started coming on her. And he said, I went over to her, and he said, I asked her if there's anything I could do to help her. And anyway, she burst into tears and, and started crying and repentance and remorse. And uh, so he prayed with her. And the owner of the company, who didn't happen to be a Christian either, came in. And he said, well, maybe we just need to have a time of prayer here. So they had a time of prayer. And he said, the whole place, conviction fell on the whole place. 3,000 employees. A few days later, they had revival meetings in the factory, and over 3,000 people got saved. That's from one man walking with the anointing of God on their life. You think power and anointing is a big deal? Oh, yes. Brother Rhodes tells a story of going into IGA and the Spirit of God was on him so much that the cashiers and everyone, I, it might have not been IGA. Honey, where was that? Was it IGA? And everyone just kind of froze in place and no one could do anything. 
And it was on him so strong that the manager of the store actually had to come over to him and say, Brother Rhodes, uh, we need you to leave the store. Because no one's getting any work done right now. Now you tell me that's not doing good to people. You tell me that's not leaving a mark. Mm -hmm. Listen, folks. We need the anointing of God. Because the anointing of God is going to change and break and deliver people from bondage, from corruption, from slavery, from unforgiveness, all these things. That even good preaching and, and all these other things that mean a lot, good teaching, that's not going to do without the anointing. So we need the anointing of God to, to, to first rest upon us because we're victorious believers. And watch that anointing start working in the lives of people that you interact with. And watch that anointing bring you into situations and opportunities that you would have never had before if that anointing went on your, on your life. And that anointing is for every person that's part of this service today. There is a, an anointing of God that He wants to place upon your life in a greater measure than you haven't experienced yet. And we need it. I want it for my life. Some of you young people, some of you go to school, some of you are homeschooled, whoever, whatever it is. You need the anointing of God to be able to live for God in your generation. Because most of the world is probably not going to do the things that you want to do. The things that you want to stand up for and live for with God. You need the anointing of God, but when there's something about the anointing of God, that even when you suffer reje rejection, which it will happen, or it should, if it's not happening... Uh, maybe we need to check ourselves, but when rejection happens, that you can still have a clear conscience before God, and you don't have to hold hatred in your heart, you don't have to hold bitterness in it, all those things in your heart that want to come because people come against you. Okay? The anointing of God is here to break unforgiveness in this house. The anointing of God is here to break selfishness in this house. The anointing of God is here to break the cycles of our mind that get us into ruts of thinking that are not God. Whether it's, whether it's uh, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, worldliness, the desire for worldliness. Listen, if you experience a so-called freedom and it pulls you away from God and the people of God and church, it ain't freedom. It's called bondage. And there's a lot of people eating that fruit today. It ain't God. It doesn't make you pray more. It doesn't make you want to seek God more. It makes you want to do the world more. It ain't God. God's always challenging us to a deeper walk with Him. It's always challenging us to accountability. Let me pull up a... Uh, an email that I got on my phone here. He was talking about John Wesley. And uh, the reason the Methodists were so uh, powerful in their day and their generation, and the re probably the reason the denomination, denomination still exists today is because, is because of John Wesley's leadership and organization as a preacher. There were many preachers that could probably out-preach him in his day, but it was because of his organizational skills and, and discipleship that caused that movement to prosper. But here is Wesley's five questions for small groups. So the movement, uh, people started getting saved under the preaching of John Wesley, and so they started on these small group meetings to help sustain the revival fire by providing community and accountability for its adherents. And so, so they had this method. That's why they were called Methodists. They would, they would do these things a certain way. And they would have questions that they would ask in these small groups. And uh, every time they would have a meeting. So the first one, listen to this. Now, y'all probably wouldn't want me to be your pastor if I would do this to you. I'm not saying I'm going to. 
But this is pretty interesting. I mean, we look at these revivalists as these great men of God that changed the culture in their generation. And we wonder, I wonder, what would it be like? What would John Wesley do in our generation? What would Charles Finney preach like? What would, they, what would they say to our generation of believers? Would they go along with the, the, the ideas, the new, new age ideas and human philosophy that has come in and, 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 and most people in the church are saying that there's a, a new recipe, there's a new way, there's a different way? Would, what would they say? What would Brother Paul say in our generation? What would he preach like? So here was the five questions that they would ask for, and this was accountability. This was on behalf of accountability. What known sins have you committed since our last meeting? What temptations have you met with was number two. Number three, how were you delivered? Number four, what have you thought, said, or done of which you doubt whether it to be sin or not. You notice the emphasis on our personal life? You notice the emphasis on repentance? Things that people just don't want in this day and generation. You notice the emphasis on accountability? Which, whether we like it or not, always brings out the best in us. Or it should. And the last but not least is, have you nothing that you desire to keep secret? So anyway, I thought that was pretty interesting. This, this came from a preacher who experienced revival in his generation. Do we want revival? We need it. Do I want to see the day where you and I can walk in a factory like that and people get changed just because of our presence in the place? Wouldn't you want that? Let's start with our homes. Just because Mama's on fire for God. Mama is so on fire for God that even though Daddy doesn't like it and doesn't want it, every night he goes to bed, the anointing in that house is doing secret surgery on Daddy's life. And he can't get away from it. Because mama's son, or vice versa. Your wife keeps balking, stomping her feet, and doesn't want to follow you. You don't have to say nothing. The anointing of God is going to break down the wall. It's going to break, and it does secret surgery on people's hearts. And many times you don't even have to say a word. Many times you don't even have to fling an arrow. The city is taken by the Lord of hosts himself. We've got to have the anointing. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your mercy in this house. Let your goodness come upon this people. Lord, let there be a fresh anointing re-stirred in our hearts and in our minds. Lord, in ways that we've never experienced before. Lord, let a hunger and a passion arise in this place in ways that men and women have an experience. Lord, I see times of refreshing coming to people throughout this house. And Lord God, those times of refreshing are going to come upon the innocent that stand before you with clean hands and a pure heart. And those who have not lifted up their soul unto vanity, those who have chosen to walk with you, those times of refreshing are upon us. And so, Heavenly Father, we will sit here and we will wait and we will receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. If there's anyone in this house today, if you need a greater measure of the anointing, if you need a refreshing in your life, your life's been barren and dry, whatever it is, maybe you need healing. Maybe you're 